our heart's cry this morning is to be a church. Our vision, our passion should be a church that is on fire for you. A church that is loving, a church that longs for you, a church that loves you. Anoint this time together this morning. Guard our hearts, guard our minds, guard our thoughts. Let us lift high your name. Have me behind the cross in Christ's name. Amen. There's a certain church that has a service played on TV that I tune into every now and then uh, against the wishes of my wife. She says, don't do that. It makes you upset. You know, and, but I, I like tuning into this church for a couple of reasons. Their music is phenomenal. Their music is absolutely phenomenal. Great voices, great uh, sound. The, the preacher is engaging and very articulate, very, a very good communicator. And it looks like all this is just making up a great church. But there is one problem that I have uh, an issue with. There's no substance. There is no digging in the text. There's no exegeting of the text. There's no supported passages presented. There's no uh, applicational text. It is just a complete lack of biblical teaching. Um, here's a twist, though. I know of a smaller church that teaches from God's word, that loves the Lord, but there is little growth. So the question becomes, how is it that a church growing? Is there a blessing from God enveloping that place? Is it being ran off of biblical principles? You see, a, uh, you see this mega church and you see them growing and expanding and filling stadiums and you're like, what is different about that church? There is no substance, and this smaller church that preaches from the word that is not growing. So we start deciphering. Well, this mega church has some brilliant minds that are innovative and cutting edge. They know how to attract. They use a lot of money. They use programs. They use different outreaches and ministries. That's how they can attract. They have, of course, a TV program. They have a great sounding music. There's good ways to attract. We'd all agree with that. But the smaller church, we understand, okay, so it's teaching from God's word, but how come it's not attracting? And we come down to, well, maybe it has a, a legalistic type of view. Maybe there, it is a church that is not spirited with grace in it. Maybe it's a, it's a church that um, is scared to go outside of its boundaries. Maybe it's a church that is so complacent on where they are that they are afraid to move forward. Of course, people will not come. People can recognize, recognize those hindrances. So how does a church grow is what comes down to our question. What needs to happen for a church to grow? What is the formula? What do people inside the church, individuals, need to do? Is it programs? Is it preaching? Is it the music? What is it? What is the formula to make a church grow? Well, last week I started this sermon series on the anatomy of the church. And like I said, as I keep digging into uh, studying more and more and trying to put all my thoughts together and dividing it up into a bunch of different messages, this beast is just growing, guys. It is just growing. And I'm not sure when I'm going to cut this series off, but probably the first of the year. That's what it's looking like. But uh, anyway, uh, and, and as I start gathering all my thoughts together and placing it, it has just given me a whole different light of what the church looks like. It is kind of refreshing within my soul again what we as a church need to look like. Last week, I started with two non-negotiables, and those are two non-negotiables that I will not debate on. There's no debate. A church needs to recognize the authority of Scripture. We're not going to debate that. That is one thing that we're going to stand on. It's the inerrant, infallible Word of God. It's God's Word breathed through the pen of man. And that is what we're going to stand on as a church. It's non-negotiable, not up for debate. Secondly, it's non-negotiable to not obey the ordinances of the church. Christ commanded to go and to baptize. It was a command. 
is an emphatic command. You go and do this. There's no option. And then he also commanded to observe the Lord's Supper. He's saying to remember me for what I have done for you in remembrance of me. So those are two non-negotiables, the authority of Scripture and the ordinances that uh, we practice here in the church. That is what we're going to stand on. And as long as I'm pastor, we're going to stand on those things. This morning, we're going to, uh, excuse me, <coughs> bless me. This morning, we're going to see um, from Colossians 1, Christ is the source and sustainer of two bodies. Um, we're kind of switching directions. There's our two non-negotiables that as a church we're standing on. But now we've got to understand really who is at the top. Where does it all begin? Where does it all originate? And so from Colossians chapter 1, we're going to see Christ is the source and sustainer of two bodies. And I believe this is essential in understanding the anatomy of the church, the structure of how we as body of believers function or need to function. <clears throat> Here's my purpose. And my purpose and timeless truth, it's, it, 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 those are the same thing. Purpose and timeless truth are the same thing. So you might see them differently up here. But here's my purpose. My purpose is this. Since You're way ahead of me, bro. My purpose is this. Since Christ is the head, the source and sustainer, we need to submit to his headship and let him control all that we do. Since Christ is the head, the source and sustainer, we need to submit to his headship and let him control all that we do. Now, to set this text up, we need to understand that the passage we are dealing with is the very foundation of our faith. It is the heartbeat of Christianity. This is the battleground in which we fight cults. This is the battleground in which we fight religions and everything else that wants to take Christianity out. This is what makes the Bible the Bible. I've often heard that um, the Bible is called the Jesus book. Uh, you can start in the Old Testament and see the preparations of Christ's coming. You can look into the Gospels and you can see the presentation of Christ all the way throughout, his miracles, his life, his journey. You can see the, God, or, uh, you can see the proclamation of his message of salvation as you continue going on through the epistles. And you can see his personification and his predomination when he reigns on the throne in Revelation. So you can see Christ's huge story all the way through the whole Bible. In fact, in Acts 8, 35, Philip was talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. Do you remember? And when Philip jumped up into the carriage to start explaining to the Ethiopian eunuch the scriptures that he was reading, remember where he is at? He was in Isaiah, and this was Philip. He opened his mouth and began from the scripture, and he preached what? It says, the verse says, he preached Jesus to him. So he preached Jesus from Isaiah. He preached Jesus from the Old Testament. So basically saying this, we can look all the way from Old Testament to New Testament and see this whole love story of Jesus and what he has done for us. So what am I getting at? The Bible is a Jesus book. It points, shows, and demonstrates Jesus all the way throughout it. But no book gives us a better understanding of Jesus and who he is than right here in the book of Colossians. And this is what we're talking about here in the book of Colossians to kind of set this whole monstrous of a passage up. It's talking about the deity of Christ, basically Christ being God. And this is the starting point. This is the heartbeat of the Christian faith. This is what religions fight and differ over. The deity of Christ is the heartbeat of Christianity. If Christ is not God, there's no Christianity. So it's that the very essence of who we are, Christ has to be God in order for Christianity to work. And this is what Paul was actually coming to when he was writing to the book of Colossia. He's saying, uh, he basically heard through um, Epaphras, his buddy, his friend who went down there to start the church. He's, uh, he heard through Epaphras about all these heresies that were starting to infiltrate the church there in Colossians, Colossia. And, and Paul wants to write directly and forcefully about those heresies, that, the, the false religion. And we know that today as Gnosticism, the attack on the deity of Christ, the total sufficient 
su su uh, Savior. And Paul's writing in a direct and forceful <coughs> manner to this. So if you would look with me, starting in verse 15 of chapter 1, verse 15 of chapter 1, like I said, we do not have time to, 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 to rip this, this passage apart. This passage is loaded, my friend. Um, I'm just going to pick out a couple of things and you're going to have to bear with me because it's going fast. But here in verse 15, it says he is the image. Who is the image? Christ is the image. As we get that from chapter or verse 13, uh, he is the image. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, in who? In Christ, all things hold together. He, Christ, is also head of the body, the church. And he, Christ, is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he, Christ himself, will come to have first place in everything. For it is the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having been made peace through the blood of the cross through him. Father God, I pray a blessing upon the scripture this morning that you will deal, that you will... Um, change, convict, and, and, uh, and draw near to you, uh, those of us that uh, pray for the open mind, Father, as we look into this heavy passage in Christ's name. Amen. So there's our background, our background set. Uh, let's look at these two bodies of Christ, sustainer and source. Roman numeral number one, Christ is the source and sustainer of creation. I want you to notice how Paul starts to methodically set this passage up how Paul attacks this problem, this problem with accepting Christ as divine, the deity of Christ. Paul greets the church in Colossia. He thanks God for them. He does all that kind of nice amenities. How are y'all doing? I thank God for you. You're in my prayers. He goes all the way there to verse three and following. After that, he says uh, he's prayed for them that they walk worthy of his pleasing, of God's pleasing. He wants them to walk worthy of his pleasing. And then in verse 7, Paul says, you know, I've not been to your church yet. However, Epaphras has told me a lot, and uh, he's given me a report on y'all. And, uh, and then verses 12 and 14, watch how Paul sets this up. Paul thanks God for the salvation that they all enjoy. And here's the phrase that he uses there. He says, the inheritance of the saints in light. He's like, we all get this inheritance because of the salvation that we have the privilege of having. And then this is where he spins off and he gets things kicking. Here's his main point. He gets all of his introduction out of the way. He lays the groundwork and then he begins to make his point in verses 13 and 14. And let me paraphrase it. He says this, listen, church, the one who has redeemed us, the one who has forgiven us, the one who has delivered us from the power of darkness, the son who possesses the kingdom, the one who is the image of the invisible God, that one that person that redeemed us, that one, that's God. And then we pick up in verse 15. He says, all right, and let me prove it to you. Verse 15, he, who's the he? The he is referring back to verse 13. Like I said, he, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, we know immediately from our Bible studies that we can go, Genesis 127, aren't, aren't we all created in the image of God? That's true. But this Greek word has a, a, a little bit different of a, of a twist on it. It means the exact image, the perfect image. It means the exact stamp, the exact engraving tool is what it means. The exact reproduction. So Jesus is the exact reproduction of God. There's nothing missing, nothing altered, nothing changed. Everything is exactly like him. First John 1 John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. We know also in Philippians 2.6, we know this verse well, He existed in the what? In the form of God. And then again in Hebrews 1.3, and y'all can just write this verse down, Hebrews 1.3, because I'm going to come back to it several more times. Hebrews 1.3, and He is the radiance. Christ is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. So he's the exact replica of God. All this meaning, the word for the image back in Colossians 1, he is the precise copy. 
Christ is the perfect, unblemished replica of God. He's not a mere sketch. He's not a close enough. He's all filled in. And later on in Colossians, if you look um, there in verse 9 of chapter 2, I believe, yep. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So Paul's making the point, Christ is God. Don't argue with me. He's the exact replica of God. And, and like I said, that is just, just a mere, uh, just a mere brief note on, on that. I could, we could spend forever in those verses there, but I need to move forward. All this meaning, or with that, that's the deity of Christ. Um, here in verse 17, I want to go to why he's arguing. He's placing Christ as supreme, why he's arguing that, why he sets all that up. And he starts in verse 17. He says this, he, there's that emphatic personal pronoun, meaning he himself, he, no one other, he is before. Now the preposition there before, why would the Holy Spirit throw it in? Well, it's in rep prospect of priority it is the priority of eternity remember uh, uh verses are leaving me uh john 1 1 john 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he was in the beginning with god all things were came into being through him and apart from him nothing came into being we know that paul points out the same thing he's like christ he is before, in retrospect, in priority. Ray Steadman says this. He's, uh, uh, he says this quote, Paul's saying that Christ is outside his own creation. He was there first, which describes his eternity as the son of God. He is over creation as a king and a sovereign, not subject to it or part of it, but intimately related to it. Excuse me. But not only is Christ before all creation and is outside of creation himself, but look at verse 17. And now Paul, Paul starts putting the punches in on him. He says, and in, him, and in him all things hold together. Notice again the repetition of that phrase, all things. It is emphasizing the total, the totality sovereignty, his total control, his complete source and sustainment over all creation. Jesus created it, and now he sustains it. And again, if you look over in that verse, Hebrews 1, 3, that I told you to write down, Hebrews 1, 3, the author says, and he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. So there again we see it. Here's something to spin our minds. Uh, the puzzle of the nucleus of the atoms that hold together. I don't know if y'all uh, get into any of that. <clears throat> the consideration of the dilemma of the nuclear uh, scientist when he finally looks in utter amazement at the pattern of these oxygen nucleus. For inside it, there are eight positively charged protons, right? And, and associated together within that, there are eight that are positively charged, and then there are eight that are neutral, Right? And earlier, physicists had discovered that like charges of electricity and like magnet charges, they repel each other, correct? And it has to take unlike charges to attract. And in the entire history of electrical phenomenon and electrical equipment, they come up with those principles, and we know this because we're good scientists, uh, Columbus laws of electrostatic force. We know that. It comes easy to ourselves. The law of Macken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the question comes, who holds this nucleus together? Why doesn't it fly apart? And therefore, why do not all the atoms fly apart? Well, in 1920 and 1930s, they, um, they tried to come up, they came up with this law and they tried to apply it to the atomic nuclei. And what they did was they used powerful atom smashers and they were used to fire protons into the nuclei of the atoms. And these experiences gave scientists an understanding of the incredible powerful force that these protons hold together within that nucleus. 
and they dubbed this force known as this, and I quote, strong nuclear force, and they had no explanation why it exists. George Gamow, he is the founder of one of the Big Bang theories. He says this, and I quote, the fact that we live in a world in which practically every object is a potential nuclear explosive without being blown to bits is due to the extreme difficulties that attend the starting of a nuclear reaction. Excuse me. <coughs> oh. I'm wearing a different perfume and it's bothering me. That was a joke. Okay, you grasp what this is implies, is what I'm getting at. It implies that all the massive nuclei have no right to be alive at all, is what it means. Indeed, they should have never been created, and if they had been created, it should instantly blow up. Yet here they all are, somehow holding together. It's such a secret. It's definitely a topic for another day, but as I got to thinking about that and reading that article, uh, we know that one day that supernatural hold upon those explosive nucleus will be released. In 2 Peter 3.10, actually it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be all burned up. So we're, we're walking around there's little explosives everywhere. And people wonder where Christ is going to get that fire. Well, hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. So what does all this mean for us as a church? For us individually? What should be taken away from Christ sustaining and being the source of the body of creation? Here's what needs to be understood. how insignificantly small you are. We need to understand how insignificantly small we are. When we puff up with pride, when we fight to go our own way, when we push God aside and use our own agenda, agenda this is what we have done. We have dethroned God. We told God to get off his throne and uh, we'll take his place for a little while since he seems to be not doing as good a job as I can. So when we fight and we bicker and we puff and we push God aside, we dethrone the Almighty, the one who is holding everything together. In Acts 17, 28, it says this, for in him we live and move and exist. So what do we need to do, church? We need to recognize who God is and who we are. That's the starting part. We need to recognize who he is and who we are. And we do that by daily, as I said, deny our selfish ambitions, putting God first. We do that by understanding that this world is too short to live in, too, and there are too many people dying and being eternally separated from this creator forever. And instead of going our way and doing our own thing, what we need to do is we need to be going out and ministering to the hurting. We need to be reaching the lost. We need to be helping the wounded. We need to be loving the people as Christ commanded us to do. There's the start. I appreciate that so much, so much. I'm sorry, y'all. Let me pause for half a second. I'm going to point two. So not only is it true that Christ is the source and sustainer of creation, but look at Roman numeral number two. Christ is the uh, source and sustainer of the church. Here's our answer to all of our questions, folks. Here's why we go to church. Here's why we spend money at the church. Here's why we do things in the church. Here's why we get together and, and sing and make praises as a church. Here's why we function with absolute excellence and we discipline ourselves for the service of godliness in the church look at verse 18 here's our answer he there's our emphatic pronoun again christ again him and no one else he is also head of the body 
the church. Not only is he creator, sustainer, source of the universe, not only does he hold all things together in creation, but he is also the head and holding everything together in his spiritual creation. He is the head. The work in the Greek is kephal, meaning source, origin, ruler. He is the originator. He is the start. Listen to me. Jesus is the source of and leader of his body, the church. He controls every part of his body, the church, because that's what the head does. The head controls the body. His inspiring, ruling, guiding, combining, sustaining power, the center of unity, Christ controls the church. Paul reminds the saints in Ephesus, starting uh, Ephesians 1, he says, And he, Christ, put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Verse 18 continues. And he, Christ, is the beginning. Beginning in the Greek there is arche, meaning the initial starting point. He's the first, the chief, the foremost, priority, the preeminent, the originator, the firstborn, the protokos. He is number one, is who he is. The starting point, the head. He controls the body. And what so many churches like to do is the body control the head. We'll put the head where we want to put the head. Since we're the body, we'll just kind of move the head wherever we want to go. But the head controls the body. He's the number one, the protokos. Chris and I took uh, the family to the pumpkin patch the other afternoon. And as you're walking through doing all those silly, goofy stuff, um, through the core maze and obstacles and all that jazz, Chris and stopped and took some pictures of the kids as they come to those... um, um, plywood cutouts. You know, they have those plywood cutouts of deformed bodies, cowboys and scarecrows and stuff like that, you know. So they'd stick their head through there in those cutouts and take this picture and you put this cute little picture of Ashen's head on this ugly, bloated scarecrow. And you all know what I'm talking about. You, you, we, we've all seen that. But as I got looking at that, I went home and I erased the illustration that I had in this point, And I put this one in here because I couldn't help but wonder, is this the same way with our church? Is Christ's head on a weird, distorted body? Is Christ's head of our local church body? Without Christ as the head, the church cannot think the truth, act the truth incorrectly. It cannot decide on which direction to grow. Just as someone neglects and abuses their body in the physical sense, if we neglect and abuse our body in the spiritual sense, we're going to be unfit for the instrument of Christ. To, to be living an undisciplined, careless lifestyle with inside the church, we don't become an instrument for the head to use. Just as the human body is powerless without its head, so too the church is powerless without its living head, Jesus Christ. What is happening in our church that can be explained only, the only explanation we can come up with is because Christ is in it. We don't understand how it's happening. We just know it's happening because Christ is moving in it. If the Holy Spirit has sucked out of every program and ministry in our church, how many of those ministries and programs will continue to run because man efforts? If the Holy Spirit is dragged out of every aspect, every facet of our church, is this church continuing to thriving on because man's efforts is forcing it to thrive? Can we as a church see Christ actually running the church? 
Or is this potty try, body trying to decapitate the head? Romans 12, 5. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So what are the litmus tests that we can put our church through to see if Christ is the head? There's the tough passage. I exegeted the best I know how to, drug out the Greek. I've explained it. I've supported the passages to it. So, all right, there's the, let's deal with it. Litmus tests. What needs to happen? Well, here are a few that I come up with. Is there confusion in our church? Is there confusion in our church? 1 Corinthians 14.33 says this, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God doesn't want his church to be chaotic. He doesn't want confusion involved in it. So is there confusion in church? There's litmus test number one. Number two, is the church being ran, which is established by the authoritative scriptures? For an example, Ephesians 4.11 and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to build up the body of Christ, the church. And number three, and we could come up with many of these, is our church being in the sin of partiality toward people. Do we show Love to the fallen? Do we show grace to those who need to be restored? James 2.8. And I just got done preaching a series on James 2.8. And she can attest to that. James, tough book. But James 2.8. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the royal law being described there in James is love your neighbor as yourself. Is it displaying love here in the church? And then it says, you are doing well if you're doing that. If you love your neighbor, great, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing a sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So what are we to do, church? Well, allow the source of creation and the source of the church control his body. <coughs> Remove self and allow Christ. And it's a, and, and here's, here's the truth and here's the honest fact, and we're not gonna, we're not gonna um, ignore this, but it's a daily thing. As humans were tainted with sin, remember that. And it's easier to go along with the human flesh side of us and to do things the fleshly side. So it has to be a continually denying of yourself in order for it to work. You know, there's, there's so much more that I, I, I feel sometimes that I don't do passages justice, especially when they're that big. But it, what I wanted to come from here is, since this is such a powerful passage, it clearly shows Christ's the source and sustainer of creation. You see the deity of Christ in it. And he was there from the beginning. He is outside of it. Creation continues to exist because Christ is holding it together. And this is the point that I don't want us to miss. Christ is the source and sustainer of the church. And here it is, y'all. In order for the church to grow, in order for the church to function as it's supposed to be, Christ needs to run it. So when we ask the question, what needs to happen to grow our church? We can come back with Christ needs to run it. What in the church will continually run if the Holy Spirit was sucked out of it? Because man's effort is keeping it going. In 1873, in Dublin, D.L. Moody heard this British evangelist, and this evangelist uttered these words, and I quote, The world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through 
and in a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. It was after that prayer meeting that um, D.L. Moody was in a house and he was, um, he got a visit with his evangelist a, a year later and Moody replied to him, do you remember saying these words? And the evangelist said, no, I, I don't remember. And Moody said, well, as I crossed the wide Atlantic to go back home, Moody said, the boards of the deck and that ship just creaked out those words. The world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. He said, when I reached Chicago, the pavement stones that I walked on echoed those words in my head again, the world is yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in a man or a church who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. So you know what D.L. Moody did? He went home and stripped and canned half of his ministries and programs. He stripped it all down and says, we're going to go with the basics because they were clouding everything up. He said, we're going to start concentrating on reaching out evangelism, loving as a church should do. Jesus Christ is not valued at all until he is valued above all. Jesus Christ is not valued at all until he is valued above all. If a husband was 85% faithful to his wife, we're considering him to be unfaithful. If we are only 85% faithful to Christ. We are unfaithful. And this is the heartbeat of the church. This is the cry of our heart of the church. Where's the starting point? A.W. Tozer, he, uh, he comes up with three good points, distinct marks. Number one, Here's a church that, uh, that is, if, you, if a church is wanting to be solely putting Christ at the head, he says this, they're going to be crucified with Christ, yes, but number one, they are facing only one direction. That, they're not getting distracted. They have blinders on, and they're facing only one direction, Christ at the head. Secondly, they never turn their back. They see the head, and they'll never worry. They never turn their back. And thirdly, they no longer have plans of their own. Christ will move through the scriptures, will move through the hearts of the leaders and the pastors, and will move the people and the church forward. So if we are to come up with how does God grow churches? Christ at the head. Christ at the head. And here it is. That, that's it's probably one of those sermons that you don't like to preach because that definitely doesn't attract. But what I have committed myself to do is to faithfully preach and exposit the word. And I know that's what Christ commanded us to do, to be authoritative with the scriptures. And that's what we're going to stand on. So here's, here's, I think, the things that we need to ponder in our heart and in our mind. As Jeremiah comes over and we just kind of turn into a, a, a time of, of uh, reasoning within our heart, of, of meditating with God, of thinking. If everyone would just kind of close their eyes and bow their head for a minute to think that uh, where in my life, Do I need to change? Just on an individual basis at the moment, where do I need to change? Am I fully dedicated, sold out, consecrated? Am I 95% faithful? Well, we're still 5% unfaithful, meaning we're unfaithful. Or are we wanting to be individually 100% faithful, giving up, those those things in our life that we want to hold on to. Then turn your mind to Clear Creek. 
What are we as a church wanting to do? Are we wanting to move forward? Are we wanting to see growth? Are we wanting to see Christ move in this church? Then if that's the case, then Scripture shows that we um, need to put him at the head. We need to put him at the head. We need to minister with grace. We need to minister with love. We need to minister to, to reach out as a body of Christ should do. Because that's what Christ would do. I also always want to give that invitation if there's some reason you have never accepted Christ into your heart. Just understanding that Christ came as fully God, fully man. Walked this earth perfectly. Died on the cross on a place where he should not have been for your sins and mine. Rose and defeated death. He's now sitting right hand of the throne of God, sustaining, holding all things together. If you just accept him, if you believe that he did all that, and ask forgiveness for your sins, the Bible says you will be saved. Father God, I pray that this is now your invitation. I pray that individually that you'll change, you'll convict, that you'll draw near to you those who maybe have been wandering, maybe those who are wanting to grow stronger, those who are are reaching out, looking for answers. I pray that you will attract them. I pray as a church that we get into the mindset of what you have established, that this is what you gave your life up for. You gave your life up for the church. And that's nothing to neglect. We need to move forward with you as the head. And we pray that you, we give you the, 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 the first and foremost spot starts with us, starts with the church. We ask this all in Jesus' name.